Veterans of Peace, we work as a team. We're just a wonderful group of people. But we've also joined forces with Peace Action Maine, Physicians for Social Responsibility, right? <laughs> Moms Demand Action, Third Act. Um, am I forgetting anybody? Um, and you know, and, and what I like to tell people is that you know, all of this talk about all of this dissension and all around the world, this is real community. I mean, look at it right now, right? I mean, look at the folks that are here. We're a community of people who are concerned about the world, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, um, I want to thank you all for being here. Before we start our program, are they here or not? I would like to thank Demillo's crew for providing us with a means to our program. Thank you, Demillo. Thank you, Demillo's staff. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, with every event ever organized, uh, there are a few people on the team who went the extra mile. Okay, so I would like the, the following people to come up here, please. Martha Spies. No. Yes. <laughs> Connie Jordan. Peter Morgan. Jackie Devereaux. And Diane Kevin. We have a special gift for you folks for what you've done for us. Voila. Flowers for Connie. <laughs> Peter, come here. Peter's a Coast Guard dude, right? So this would be appropriate for Peter. Come here. <laughs> Thank you. Flowers for Jackie. Jackie's the person who arranged to have the indigenous uh, spokesperson who's going to be with us in a second to be here, and also the wonderful Portland Council reading. Thank you, Jackie. Diane is a person who's, uh, she and her husband, bless your soul, have, have opened up their house to the crew of the Golden Rule, so they have a wonderful place to stay. Martha Spies is from Peace Action, Maine, and she put together all of this stuff, including what's going to be happening in Bath. So she's a, an amazing human being. And I've, all, and I've often said that perhaps the, the, this night should be called Connie Jordan Night. Yes. She has put together this whole thing at DeMillo's. Her contacts, the docking of the boat at DeMillo's, this meal, all of this thing is because of Connie Jordan. So, wonderful, wonderful work. Peter Morgan has worked behind the scenes, as he always does, but he's put together this bath thing that we've got going on a little bit later, which we'll talk about. So there are lots of people that have been involved in this stuff, but these folks really came forward and did this amazing stuff, so uh, we appreciate that. Um, special shout out to Peter Wilk. Where's Peter? Peter, you want to stand? Physician for Social Responsibility. I would like to read this pro oops, I can find it. I'd like to read this proclamation. Jackie lined up to have the mayor of Portland. Well, it says Kate Snyder, mayor of the city of Portland. Okay, anyway, it's proclamation welcoming the Golden Rule to Portland, Maine. Here it is, very quick. Whereas in February 1958, four Quaker activists sailed the Golden Rule from California towards the Marshall Islands in an attempt to stop nuclear bomb tests in the Pacific and were arrested, prompting worldwide protests which helped convince President John F. Kennedy to sign the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963. Whereas today, 15,000 nuclear warheads remain mostly under the control of Russia and the United States, and the United States has suspended its compliance with the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and other nuclear arms limitation treaties and plans to spend nearly $2 trillion on its nuclear arsenal, and whereas the Golden Rule has been restored by Veterans for Peace and will be in Portland, Maine from June 25th, 2023 to the June, June 28th, to support the United Nations Treaty on the prohibition, prohibition of nuclear weapons, raise awareness about the environmental and human costs of military and nuclear activities, and support efforts to stop the possibility of nuclear war. Therefore, be it resolved that Kate Snyder, that I, Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland, Maine, and members of the Portland City Council do hereby welcome 
the Golden Rule, Portland, Maine. And, ex and extend best wishes for a successful journey. Signed, Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland. I would be remiss if I did not mention that Maine is the birthplace of Veterans for Peace. In 1985, five of us formed this group that now has 130 chapters all around the United States, six international chapters, and we have NGO status at the United Nations. I have to say, as a co-founder of Veterans for Peace, this boat is the most powerful manifestation of our finding principle, founding principles that we have ever had. We are a 501c3 devoted to educating the world about the realities of war. In 1985, we recognized the special danger of nuclear weapons, and the Golden, Cruel, Golden Rule crew are carrying out this mission with great professionalism and passion. With the crew of the Golden Rule, please stand. Thank you for your devotion, and Peggy Akers has a special gift for the crew. Debbie, you need to come up. Oh. Here's the captain. <laughs> my daughter, who's been my biggest cheerleader since she was a little girl in, in all peace efforts, made this boat for all of you. It's from Wood. Driftwood from a little island about 12 miles out of Cliff Island and sailed from there, and she made it for you. Wow. Oh. Peggy, well, all right. So we're about ready to start the program, um, which is not necessarily typical of someone like me. I blew it. At the, at the beginning of this meal, I was supposed to take time to have a devotion read, um, and I forgot. So, we have we are blessed to have Miku Paul with us here this evening, who will give us a, this devotion and then also read one of her amazing, powerful poems uh, about life in this planet. So, Miku, please. The piece of paper you've got on your, paper, on your table, by the way, is her dedication that she read as the boat arrived. Good evening. You know, we're all here tonight for a purpose, but I, I recognize, too, that we arrive at and we enact that purpose in very different ways. Um, and I honor that. There are just so many paths that people take uh, toward the end of peace and building community within the human family. So um, I'm not, you know, a pipe carrier, but I will say that um, uh, we ask each of us here tonight, we ask Creator, Anewi Gwaset, Earth Mother, um, to uh, recognize our efforts and that we do the most and best that we can in our own imperfect way. And I would ask that we hold our awareness and reverence for every single living thing that is on our precious home, this planet, and consider how we walk daily and how we enact that peace in our own lives at the community level and also with the organized and formal work that we do toward that greater end. Um, I would say a week was it and creator Mizide de Kadakmik Kindakwat the whole world resounds. And we know this, the world right now is like a clanging bell and we all hear it. 
Um, it's at all different levels, right? It is with the climate change. It is with our human family. It is with uh, the political structures that we understand no longer serve our advancement in a good way. So for my part, you know, I do uh, what I can to teach people about Wabnaki culture and to support learning in the schools. I'm not a terribly political person, um, but I am opinionated and I don't mind sharing that. And I'm very, very honored to be here tonight. I want to read a poem for you that is about Portland because that's where we are. Portland is actually Majigan, which is the, the crooked knee or the bent knee. And that's the name for Portland. You may not know that Portland actually had three names before they finally settled on the name of Portland. Some years ago, Colin Sargent was on a panel with me and I was with Donna Loring and he said, hey, I want you to write a poem for this anthology coming out. I really think you ought to have a poem in there. And I said, well, okay, Colin, but well, what's the lead time? And he said, two days. <laughs> so I rushed home and I said, I had told Colin, you know, I almost wanted to write about the Fort Loyal massacre. Um, for many, many years, Jordan's Meats here at the foot of Monjoy Hill had a kiosk and within that there was some text that I felt was unfair and erroneous and they were using the language, of course, that uh, many people, non-Indian people, had been, quote, massacred at that site. So I did the research and I ended up with a 66-line poem. It was as tight as I could get it. So this tonight for you is I hope entertaining and it is a history lesson about the land that we are on at this moment. Song from Mashigan. Mashigan, your truest name before the French and English came to raid the land of her tallest trees and pull the fish from her blue knee. The fur they took in trade for pots and drink and rusty blades could not sate their endless hunger or abate their supernatural greed. Oh, Mashigan, your name is dust. You have begun to bleed. Casco now is how they call the great neck as the mighty trees fall. Land divided among men is stolen once again. Weymouth kidnaps five of us before gorgeous St. John Mason arrived to claim the eastern lands and now we die and die. Treaties cannot last when traders block the fish from moving past. Cows trample our corn, yet you say we are a thorn in your side. You are the ones who cannot abide by your own laws. When we fight, we have just cause to grieve for Mashigan and those who now walk beyond this world, French or English, we must choose, or so you say, if not to lose the land we hold most dear. We come away only to starve anew. And now our hearts are hard. In spring of 1690, we gathered with Castine, our anger risen like the streams, you choked with nets to starve our kin. We followed one trusted chief, whose child the baron sought to keep. Madaka Wando leads the men, and killing will begin. Just for today, we are many and shall break our anger on your flesh, burn your walls to nothingness. 400 men and more, with fringe to batter down the door, we come to Mashigan to prove Fort Loyal cannot stand against our warring hand. And English is a worse brigand than any Frenchman, so they tell us when we fight and burn your forts down in the night. We are not the ones you trusted to survive. White flag waved before your eyes. That was Berneath in charge of keeping order 
and giving quarter. Trust is almost always wise, but not to trust your English lies. Thus you learn the bitter price you pay for our forgiveness. Six wars were fought here, laying claim to land that many tried to tame until we finally surrendered. Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Abeniki, with little left, you had not plundered from our Donland home. The Beaver Wars were fought for pelts, King Philip's War, abuse of trade, and Squando's child drowned just to see if he could swim like some wild river otter. The scalp hunters seeking bounty in the south returned to seek us out. King William's war fought for land. Fort William Henry could not stand against our warring hand. A Beneke and French who drove the English from the lower Kennebec. In 1701, Queen Anne's war came to our shores when once again, French and English wanted more and more and more. Greedy bullets, dripping blades, smoke, smoking battlements laid waste, and always we must take a side, knowing we can no longer hide from settlers thick as leaves on trees, coveting everything they see. Dummer's war for William Dummer, who sent Colonel Westbrook to burn our homes and fields and starve us out. Norwich fell 100 dead, Big Wocket too. And if you wore the other shoe, it would be dipped in red. At last, your war with France burned high for seven years. We had nothing left to lose when forced to choose between the evils that befell our people. <laughs> Three in four of us was dead, gone to the wind. Finally, you said the line was drawn in 17 and 59, those words you give to white man's time. Our demise, battle victorious, so-called history and glory, we fought for land paid in blood and bone. Matchigan, just one of many, first become Casco, then Old Falmouth. Years wore on and Portland, Maine became the name. The massacre you blame us for is but the story of your shame those sins for which you must atone. Mashikin was not your own. Thank you, Mitsu. Wonderful. Well, we have uh, the next uh, um, speaker is not a speaker at all. He's a singer. Singer and a songwriter, Pat Scanlon, Vietnam veteran, longtime member of Veterans for Peace, came up from Boston, Massachusetts, to sing us a song. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, um, my uh, mentor was uh, Pete Seeger. Most people here would be familiar with Pete Seeger, right? Uh, you're about the, about the right age group. Um, and, uh, uh, and he used to say um, that he, he'd prefer to give, he'd prefer, Pete Seeger, he'd prefer to have a, a song on people's lips than in their ears. And he also used to say, uh, a good song reminds people of what we're fighting for. So I hope that's this song. <laughs> Is there a, the people, uh, members of physicians for so, oops, members of physicians for social responsibility here? You guys? Yeah, they're here, yeah, absolutely. I wrote this song for Dr. Helen Caudicott. I had done some work with Helen Many years ago, for people who don't know, Helen Caldicott was one of the uh, founders of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and she also founded a Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament. So I did some, some projects with her when I was uh, an organizer for the Clamshell Alliance, 
and um, and so we uh, uh, and so this is this is a song that I wrote for Helen. Um, now it uh, has a chorus, as Pete would say, a good song. It reminds us what we have to fight for, what we're fighting for. So I'm going to go through this to the chorus, and when I get when you think you know the words for the chorus, I want you to put your thumbs up. All right, and then then I'll know when to start doing the song. Right? Okay. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> I hope it's in tune. So the chorus goes, um, pop, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building armaments, someday we're going to pay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Got to pay attention. So also, you know, I was in military intelligence. And, uh, and also, there's a whole story uh, with the clamshell was uh, there was an undercover police agent amongst us for a while. It's another whole story, but um, I wouldn't be surprised today because of who is in this room. Uh, if there's someone who is has blended in and is uh, maybe undercover <laughs> and letting people know about what they're planning for the boat, whatever. <laughs> but one thing about that is that. Uh, these people who are undercover will never sing these songs. So I want you to look to your right and to look to your left, right? And uh, and if if there's you know so someone's raise your hand, say keep an eye on this person over here. So okay, so we have three people who got those first lines. So it goes, pop there goes Boston. Bang, there goes LA. Okay, I mean, the people in the back there, hello? Pop, there goes Boston. Bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building armaments, someday we're gonna pay. <laughs> Oops, we just lost Detroit. New York, it is no more. If that button ever does get pushed, it's death from shore to shore. <laughs> My wife. So it goes pop, there goes Boston. Bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building our amendments, someday we're gonna pay. Oops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. If that button ever does get pushed, it's death from shore to shore. Okay. I should say, I should add, that was terrible. <laughs> You gotta sing, come on, come on. You gotta impress the crew, right? They're all this land lover stuff here. You gotta impress the crew. So, pop, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building our memory, someday we're going to pay. Oops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. If that button never does get pushed, it's death from shore to shore. 5,000 warheads stockpiled us up today, waiting for the chance to blow the Russians all away. But the Russians got them too, they're no dummies, don't you see? Only difference there's a point it right at you and me. And it's pop, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building our men, someday we're going to pay. Oops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. And that button never does get pushed, death from shore to shore. But 200,000 died with the dropping of Fat Boy. All the generals smiled, and they had a brand new toy. But on that fateful day, back in 1945, Mother Earth was crying. Need I tell you why? And it's pop, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building our memory, someday we're gonna pay. Oops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. If that button ever does get pushed, death from shore to shore. 
of building MX, Mars, and MERS. This seems to be the trend. Which country will be first to experience the end? Who's ever flown up first while the other's right behind? Just to play this game, we must be out of our minds. And it's up, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building armaments, someday we're gonna pay. Oops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. If that button never does get pushed, it's a death from shore to shore. Well, they want their B-1 bombers to try to send the crews. They got a new proof bunker, what the hell they got to lose? For every bomb that's built, they're determining our fate. These weapons must be taken away, or we'll see at the pearly gates. And it's pop, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building armaments, someday we're gonna pay. Oops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. That button never does get pushed, death from shore to shore. I don't want our children dying from a thermonuclear blast, nor the radiation to follow, which lasts and lasts and lasts. This world, it must be free from the threat of nuclear war. The bomb must be dismantled and banned forevermore. Or it's pop, there goes Boston, bang, there goes LA. If we don't stop building armaments, someday we're gonna pay. Whoops, we just lost Detroit, New York, it is no more. If that button never does get pushed, it's death from shore to shore. If that button never does get pushed, it's death from shore to shore. Thank you. One thing about that song is there's just one line in that song. I wrote this song 40 years ago. There's one line in the song that's different today than then. Just one line. Originally, it was 30,000 warheads. Then it was 20,000 warheads. Then it was 15,000 warheads. And today we have four to 5,000 warheads more powerful than the 33 warheads. That's the only line. Every other part of that song is still accurate today. And one other thing is there's more countries that have them today. Thank you, Pat. That wasn't quite easy listening, but it was wonderful. Thank you, man. He's coming back. He's got a few couple more songs for us a little bit later on. Well, one of the dangers of putting somebody my age in front of a microphone is that I have the power now to publicly embarrass anybody and so I would like to just point over here to Midori Morrow, the artist, who was that amazing part of our Saturday display. She's a granddaughter of a Nagasaki uh, survivor, and her artwork is absolutely amazing. Thank you for being here. She's a student. The next person is Andy Grinnell, who personally knew Albert Bigelow the captor and the founder of The Golden Rule. Andy. Now, it appears to me that everybody who should have been thanked has been thanked, save one obvious exception. And that would be Douglas Wallace. <laughs> so, this portrait is a classic. <laughs> this is a, a, a classic, iconic portrait of the original crew. And uh, standing over here on your left, there, I got it, uh, is. Bill Huntington. This is Captain Bert Bigelow. This is Oren Sherwood and George Willoughby. Hey, event. This is an amazing, amazing group of folks who somehow pulled off one of history's great feats. And I want to share with you this evening my, my take on it. So here we go. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, over over here so we can get a picture of you. Okay. Hold it together. No, just come. Let's get into you know, we don't like taking orders, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, here, we go. I get this one for posterity, though, Mike. Like. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah, here. I'm going to take it around a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, I don't know. Wow, this is hot. This is a, 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 an amazing set of acts to follow, so... Uh, Please, uh, bear with me. Um, these were the uh oh, this thing is kicking up on me. Here we go. I'm going to wait until it settles down. Okay, there we go. Uh, these reflections arise from asking two of the very many questions that quickly arise. First, what experiences transformed a 30-year veteran of World War II into a risk-taking, nonviolent activist? That would be Bert Bigelow. And second, what important role did the captain's wife, Sylvia Bigelow, play in the success of this improbable protest? In short, what I want to share with you this evening to help you better understand Albert Smith Bigelow, and Sylvia Weld Bigelow. First, we should start with one ringing affirmation. Bert Bigelow was the real deal. If you needed a ship captain to command the US Navy destroyer, if you needed a freedom rider to sit next to and to befriend and indeed protect the future member of Congress, John Lewis. If you needed a strong ally in the effort to make public the blatant racism in New Bedford's third district court, or on the other hand, if you needed an architect, a seascape painter, a playwright, or a cook who could prepare a tasty Japanese style feast. Well then, friends, may I commend to you a well-spoken, skilled, and best of all, truly humble guide. While it is true that Bert Bigelow died 30 years ago, thanks to our guests here this evening, Bert's legacy catches ever more wind and sails steadily onward. 52 years ago, Dorothy and I had the great good fortune to work with Bert and Sylvia. It was during the summer of 1971. Quakers gathered in the greater New Bedford area were called to respond to the cold-blooded killing. Yes, um, you could predict this, of an African Cape Verdean youth, 17 years of age, shot at point-blank range and the trial ended in a hung jury. What the killing of George Floyd created nationally in our time was akin to what the killing of Lester Lima created regionally in the summer of 1971. During the month of May, 1972, a group of us monitored the third district court's court proceedings and then issued a stinging report that was front page on the Sunday edition of the New Bedford Standard Times. And then we waited, and we waited, and it seemed like we waited for an eternity. A few weeks went by, and finally, it became one challenging month. It was a deeply troubling time for me and for all of us. Uh, but much to our relief, the Chief Justice of the District Courts, Franklin Flashner, issued his mandate for the needed reforms, and these procedural reforms lined up closely with our recommendations. Phew. We were off the hook, and we were vindicated. Now, during any season of trouble, you need strong, wise, and seasoned friends. You don't want to go into these kind of things 
without capable, seasoned friends. Well, during those weeks of July 1972, we were blessed to have both Bert and Sylvia. So here again is the key question. How was it that a decorated lieutenant commander transformed into becoming a nonviolent activist? Much of what we know is in Bert's own writing and his own recounting in The Voyage of the Golden Rule. It's, it's a quick read, by the way, and it's available as a Kindle download. I recommend it. Beginning in May of 1955, Bert and Sylvia hosted two members. I think this is the critical piece in answering the question. They hosted two members of a group known as the Hiroshima Maidens. And we're blessed to have here this evening is Mayori representing them. Thank you. All 25 suffered and had been badly disfigured by the Hiroshima blast. Through the organizing work of the Saturday Review editor, Norman Cousins, the surgical skills of Arthur Barsky and William Hitzig, and the gracious hospitality of regional Quakers, the maidens received 140 separate plastic surgeries. The four Mount Sinai surgeons worked miracles. And through these remarkable facial transfigurations, these young Japanese women were given a new lease on their 25 lives. Throughout these many months of surgeries, lasting bonds were formed between the maidens and the host Quaker families, and this was particularly true for Bert and Sylvia. Through this daily exposure to the suffering, Bert's clear intellectual grasp of the horror of nuclear war morphed into a gut sense that he was going to be personally committed to ending this madness. <clears throat> so Bert prepared by laying down and by he, he, he prepared by uh, for what lay ahead by joining the local quake meeting and very reluctantly accepting the branding of being called a pacifist that did not go well that did not go well for Bert, but he accepted it and by writing to his commanding officer that in good conscience he could not and he would not receive the retirement pay that it would be soon due him. These two sacrifices only signal more to come. Now the story of the voyage of the Golden Rule smacks of a modern day retelling of Don Quixote de la Mancha. After all, who in their right mind would attempt to sail halfway across the Pacific, all the while announcing to the authorities that he intended to defy them and then, top it off, risk his own life? Nonetheless, crazy as it might have seemed, once the idea took hold, it just could not be shaken off. This protest offered everything that the current process then lacked. The slow, steady advance of a boat into the face of grave danger offered intrigue, but perhaps best of all, it was a brand new idea. Through training and experience as a licensed architect, Bert tackled the project, every project, with attention to detail. And through the months of careful planning, the American Friends Service Committee members came increasingly to rely on Bert and while there were disagreements, they could agree on one key part of the emerging plan. The only person who could possibly pull this off was, you guessed it, Bert Begelow. And yet, right up until the decision day, and this is the most fascinating part for me, right up until that day, then Bert doubted that he or anyone could or should attempt this voyage. Then, and this is a, this is something like a religious miracle in my view. Then, after one long night of wrestling, he received the joyous signal that he would be in good hands. Now released, 
Bert and his chosen mate, Bill Huntington, flew to San Pedro, California to purchase a boat. Now, get this, this is amazing to me also. A lot of this parts of the story are improbable. But this is, they chose a brand new Costa Rican built catch that had already been christened. Please check me on this. Already been christened the Golden Rule. <laughs> Go figure. Now, once you get to, I'm, I'm switching gears. Now, once you get to know Sylvia, her critical becomes, her critical role becomes more obvious, becomes obvious. She was as passionate as she was committed. And she was deeply centered. Every boat and every crew on such a mission requires a spiritual anchor. And Sylvia was that anchor. With a sigh and a knowing smile, my mother, Edna Phillips Grinnell, was fond of a line from the great English poet, John Milton. Turning to me on occasion, she would urge, Andy, Andy, remember, they also serve who only stand and wait. I didn't get it, obviously, as a kid growing up, but I get it now. Four long years, when Bert served his country and was frequently in harm's way, Sylvia prayed and she waited. Then 13 years later, as a grandmother, she would again serve as her husband and crew faced dangers. However, this time, it would be no destroyer. Quite the opposite. This time, it would be a tiny, this is amazing, tiny 30-foot, two-masted catch attempting a near impossible mission. When the golden rule was well underway, a reporter called and asked Sylvia, did she agree with her husband that a man should be willing to give up his life for peace? Yes, yes, she said. She fully agreed. And then she explained why. We talked about this for many months, says Sylvia, before Bert went away. And in a, in a way, I feel the same way I did when he was in the Navy in that last war. He was willing to give up his life for, pe for peace then. It's no different now. They also serve who only stand and wait. While a daring adventure captivates imagination, and it is the pros but it is the prospect of suffering that draws us into a communion of empathy. The summary of the law, the prophets, and the universally known essential ethical teachings all come down to what was captured as the golden rule. But in order to practice the golden rule, you need an active imagination and a caring empathy. Fittingly, and I think mysteriously, the original Costa Rican catch was christened just that, the Golden Rule. Eight years ago this month, this resurrected sloop was rechristened using the same name. That name fitted its mission in 1958, and it certainly fits the mission today. Well, I'm going to move along very quickly. You, you probably know this part of the story. Uh, the thought that they, they tried several times unsuccessfully to leave Honolulu. They didn't succeed. They were imprisoned for 60 days. Uh, but there was great gain because the, the papers, the news cycles just couldn't get enough of this. And uh, so therefore, people were alerted to this valiant effort. It succeeded in energizing the first ever nuclear test ban movement. And that achievement, as we heard earlier, was, uh, was lifted up by John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev when they signed that treaty. That treaty was explicit. It's important to remember this in banning any nuclear explosion, whether on land, in the atmosphere, outer space, or under the water. So, we thank Bert and Sylvia Bigelow. They were faithful to the light that was given to them, each in their own way. While one saved, sailed bravely into danger, 
the other stood her ground. Be there no doubt then, friends, that tonight, at this very place, we have a cause to rejoice. The witness of Bert and Sylvia Bigelow lives on with those that we honor here tonight. So, if you'll join me, let's hear it for the crew of the Golden Rule. Hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip.